Welcome to Vinoge Cottage and our series, Between the Lines. In each episode, we will be exploring the letters of Jacob Weaver, the first owner of this building. Built in the year 1828, by 1995, this structure was derelict. It has been saved and restored. Today it is known as the Musée de Vinoge. The Weavers were typical of many 19th century Americans. Seeking better opportunities, they moved west. What makes their story remarkable are the detailed letters Jacob wrote back to his family. Certain incidents will jump out at the reader. Is what Jacob describing here the way it actually happened? Or is he merely embellishing? Join us as we read Between the Lines. Since the dawn of time, mankind has confronted illness and death. By the use of medicine, we have sought to alleviate the misery of sickness. From the common cold to the plague, man has sought answers and prescribed many cures. In today's world of vaccines and antibiotics, it's hard to comprehend the cures from doctors of Jacob's time. Even harder to comprehend is how did anyone survive those so-called cures? Melancholy. To relate now about sickness and deaths. In our village of Vivay, there have died between 40 and 50 people. This was said by people acquainted with the yellow fever in the seaports of New York, Philadelphia, or Baltimore to be a greater number here according to the number of inhabitants there. I don't believe there was one out of every ten which escaped death. Everyone was sick, more or less. None escaped but one of my small daughters. The rest of us all had it. None have been very dangerous, but all was left with a weakness. There was none of us that could do any work for about six or seven weeks of any consequence. If you became ill or injured while living in Frontier, Indiana, essentially all health care was provided in the home. You depended on your mother or your wife and the knowledge she had learned from her mother. They produced what they called simples. These were remedies or salves or cures that could be used to, to heal your wounds or your illnesses. But essentially, you were on your own. Back in 2019, Richard Moss contacted me. He's a historical researcher and he's been very generous to us here at Vinoge. He was doing an archival search and came across a list of Jacob Weaver's possessions that were sold to pay off his debts. Among the items listed was a copy of Gunn's Domestic Medicine. Dr. John Gunn's name was a familiar household word in the 19th century. He wrote his 1830 medical guide to be used by those who did not have a doctor nearby. It was the most popular one of its kind. Jacob's letters contain many references to sickness, most notably fevers, and I began wondering if he had been using this as a reference in which to treat those illnesses. Today, we have what we call OTC, or over-the-counter remedies. In Jacob's time, he was using OTG, or out-of-the-garden remedies. Gunn's domestic medicinal contained many herbal cures, whether it was in poultices or teas. Well, there are lots of herbal remedies that are still used today. You can walk into the pharmacy and see hundreds of vials derived from different herbs like Echinacea or St. John Worts and many others. And there are some other medications that we still use today commonly that are derived from herbal remedies. For instance, aspirin was initially derived from the bark of a willow tree. We still use opium-derived products like morphine and codeine. And albeit in controlled doses, but we still use those commonly today. In Jacob Weaver's writing, he refers to fevers multiple times, and probably because it's the more common sign of severe illness. And if you think about it, there weren't a lot of diagnostic tests like x-rays or labs that we would use to gain information. They had vital signs. Well, fever is one of the most obvious vital signs. And with the lack of treatment for illness, you can imagine that these illnesses may have persisted for days on end. He describes ague, which is fever and chills together and, and obviously a sign of more severe illness. He describes bilious fevers as well, which probably he's describing the jaundice that might 
develop with the infection. So it, it most likely referred to either liver infection or gallbladder disease and the result in fever and the way the patient would look. Jacob Weaver also describes a form of dysentery or something called the Mississippi complaint. And we still see dysentery frequently nowadays. Um, it's typically caused by any number of organisms. And it's referring to basically a profound vomiting and diarrhea, sometimes a hemorrhagic diarrhea, that in those days might lead to hypotensive shock and people might die from that. Nowadays, we'd attempt to find the specific cause and treat it appropriately. By 1837, Jacob Weaver and his family had been living in Indiana for 24 years, nine of those here in the Venoge Cottage. In that year, a health menace manifested itself in Switzerland County. It would not see a solution until almost 40 years after Jacob Weaver had drawn his last breath. I'll now inform you about an alarming circumstance which has been amongst us, that is, of mad dogs. Sometime last fall, there went a mad dog about who bit several dogs through the neighborhood. Most of them were killed. The dog belonging to a man by the name of William Cotton went mad and bit a little girl of about seven years old. About 40 days after the little girl was bit, she went mad. And about four days after, she died. Sometime after, there was a boy bitten by the name of McKay. He was taken to a neighboring village where there was a man who had a stone called a mad stone. He put it to the wound. It's said this will draw the poison. That was six or seven weeks ago. It's had no effect on him yet as I've heard of, and there's still some rumor of some dogs going mad about the neighborhood. Rabies is a viral disease that's been around for centuries. Uh, you can find writings of it as far back as 300 BC with Aristotle, and most likely because of the rapidly progressive and often fatal course of the illness. In fact, it's one of the most fatal infectious diseases still today. In early 19th century, hydrophobia, or as we know it, rabies, was a highly dreaded and feared disease. There was no known cure for hydrophobia, to die of hydrophobia was a horrible death. After witnessing the agonies and sufferings of loved ones, many a family on the frontier made one of the hardest decisions they could ever contemplate. As the disease progresses, they would develop more significant symptoms. One of the most interesting would be hydrophobia, which is an intense fear of drinking water because just the sensation of the liquid in the pharynx would cause involuntary spasms that are so disabling that people would avoid it drinking at all costs. And then as the disease progresses even further, patients would become agitated and combative, inconsolable, and ultimately uh, result in coma and then death. Hydrophobia would be a constant plague in not only the countryside, but cities as well. Nothing could so terrify a community more than the cry of mad dog. Newspaper articles detailed the affliction as it spread. Broadsides were printed and distributed. Committees were organized to find some sort of solution. There was only one. Guns list only one brief paragraph in regards to hydrophobia. As with many cures, it entails the use of opium and mercury. But the most interesting cure came from the New York Journal of Commerce. Reading the ingredients sounds more like something out of the witches scene from Macbeth. You will need the jawbone of a dog, burned and pulverized, then the false tongue of a newborn colt, dried and pulverized, verdigris raised on the surface of old copper laid in moist earth. Add opium or laudanum with this in a small quantity of water and drink. Opium was another substance that was used widely and it was a very effective pain reliever but it would also, in uncontrolled doses, would cause respiratory suppression and death. It was ineffective at treating the disorder, but perhaps for comfort before death, it was valuable. There were other remedies that people would try in 19th century North America. They would try heavy metals like mercury or copper. Theory was that if you could keep the wound open, that it would help draw out part of the infection. And if you actually took the mercury or the copper, 
copper by mouth, it would induce vomiting and salivation, and they felt like that might help the body rid itself of the infection. But the, the, the excessive salivation and the vomiting, that was mercury poisoning, and ultimately if you survived that and you survived the bite of the animal, you would die from kidney failure from the mercury poisoning. Jacob Weaver mentions the use of madstones in his letters. My family history tells of the possession of a madstone. The madstone was given to my ancestor, Ginsey McCoy, upon her wedding and moving to the frontier. This madstone has been passed down father to son through the generations. Madstones were harvested from the guts of ruminant animals like cows or deers or goat, and they were basically calcified blobs of undigested material and they were harvested from the animal and essentially family jewels. They were handed down generation after generation after generation. And it was thought that if you could apply the madstone directly to the wound, that it might draw out the madness of the wound. But it didn't work and people died from rabies anyway. While it's believed that these stones were only to be passed down within families, some inventive and creative entrepreneurs offered them for sale or rent in newspapers. Well, if I was bitten by a bat, I would not reach for a madstone. I would quickly seek out the vaccine. To those who believe in their healing powers, madstones are never to be sold. For it is said, when the stone is sold, the curative powers associated with it leave. From prehistoric man to guns domestic medicine, cures were often worse than diseases they treated. In contemplating those early cures, perhaps it is best to remember a prayer once offered by soldiers on many an early battlefield. Lord, deliver me into the hands of the enemy and not that of the surgeon. We hope you enjoyed our story. Until the next time we read Between the Lines, thank you for watching.